Hey friends, my name is Greg Lester and you're watching Game Audio Analysis and today I want to talk about how to go from this to that. A question I get a lot is, do I need to learn audio implementation to become a sound designer for video games? The answer is absolutely yes. Why? Because simply put, audio implementation is like plugging in a lamp. The light will turn on once it's plugged into the socket. Same goes for the audio, which will only play if it's connected to the game. So not only is it a big part of the job, but it's a creative outlet that enables you to solve problems by creating fitting, optimized, and efficient interactive audio systems for your game. The big difference between films and games or linear and interactive media is that linear media stays exactly the same. The playback is simple as the audio is chained to the video and plays in sync with it. Games on the other hand change depending on the player's action. So simply playing an audio track when the game starts won't work. But this is where audio implementation comes in. To put it into simple terms, the sound designer is populating the game world with lots of little speakers. These are so-called 3D emitters. They will play sound at their location when triggered. These can range from things like explosions to leaves ruffling or dialogue. But in order for the player to hear these sounds, we require an audio listener. This is basically a virtual pair of ears which pick up the sounds from the 2D and 3D emitters. As you just heard, we also have 2D emitters. As opposed to the 3D emitters, which are affected by spatialization, meaning the volume and pan changes based on the location of the audio listener, the 2D emitters basically come out of headphones on the virtual ears, or rather, the audio listener. This means they aren't placed in any specific spot in the game world and don't have any spatialization. So the player's location won't affect the volume or panning of the sound. Background ambience loops like a room tone or city traffic, as well as the music, are often implemented as 2D sounds. However, it is possible to transition between 2D and 3D sounds. Here's a classic example. I need to borrow your car, lady. Of course, each of these sounds need to be triggered or else they wouldn't play at the appropriate time. There are lots of different ways to trigger sounds in your game, and some of the most common ones are through button presses, objects colliding, a value being above or below a certain number, through notifiers and animations, or by being in a proximity of an object. A lot of the time, these triggers need to be set up by programmers to make the sounds play the right way we need them to. Explaining exactly what you need can feel like a daunting task, because there is an inherent language barrier between the audio and the programming jargon. So I spoke to Sam Hayhurst, gameplay programmer at Glowmate and close friend of mine, about his experience of working with sound designers for many years. The first thing that we nail down is what is it that we're trying to achieve together? Normally what happens is I'll have a Google document open and I'll share this with them. And so they can double check what I'm writing because what we're trying to do is information has to come from their head and it has to reach my head correctly. Problem is, is that they could explain it. I could misunderstand it, write down something wrong. And so this work document is here so that they can check it. And so all of these will normally be worded with when X happens, I play Y sound. If the player equips the hammer, I change this switch in Ys. The biggest mistake there is them coming at me with too technical jargon, which they may have picked up from like previous programmers or engineers. So I think the first thing is like really cleanly nail down in plain language, what is it that you're trying to achieve? The second thing is like programmers really tend to think especially with regards to audio in events. Like the game state has changed, then things happen. Uh, others are triggers, but normally you a word, you know, near to that. What I'm really trying to get at is that basically the programmer needs to know when to start the sound and that's going to be how they think. 
if you're not sure if something is final, mention when you're talking about it, oh, I'm not sure how I want this to sound yet. I'm going to want to tweak it. Is that possible? Because what will happen then is the program will be like, what I'm going to do, and here's a key word that I always use, is like expose the value. Um, and what that means is the sound person will be able to change the audio, or how the sound is triggered, when it's triggered, the volume, whether or not it ducks other sounds, all these kind of things. If our conversation, text conversation, is going to be like more than three to four replies, let's just talk it out. Text is so slow and it's so easy to miscommunicate and also come across too sarcastic or too aggressive or something like this. Never try to do the programmer's job because programmers can get quite defensive about that. Whereas if you ask them in kind of plain English, phrase it as a problem that you can both work on. So to sum up, the most important aspects to keep in mind when collaborating with a programmer or game designers are explain exactly and in very simple terms what you want the sound event to do. Make it clear whether you intend to make changes to the audio feature in question. Clarify whether it's a prototype that might be thrown away or if it's a feature that's here to stay. Don't be afraid to ask for things. Speak face to face or call because lots of information can be lost in text. Take the time to get to know each other and build a stronger working relationship. And lastly, don't tell the programmer how to do their job. After all, you wouldn't want them instructing you how to design the audio. So now that we can break the ice with the programmers and get some events set up to play our sounds in game, all we need to do is hook them up. The way this works is that we take our audio files and import them either directly into the game engine or into a tool called Audio Middleware. Then we create audio events, also referred to as sound cues, and put the sounds we want to play into those events. The audio event acts like a container that can have any number of sounds within it and provides the playback instructions. For example, we can create a play footstep event which houses 20 different footstep sounds of which a random one will be picked each time the event is triggered. Additionally, we can modulate the pitch and volume to create even more variations. But this is just scratching the surface of what you can do. And I will cover more of that in a future video. The question is, what is the difference between integrating sounds directly in the engine versus using audio middleware? The answer is quite simple. Audio middleware like FMOD and WISE are third party tools that sit between the game engine and the audio hardware. They have a huge plethora of features that enable sound designers to create complex audio systems by using the functionality they provide. This ranges from basic things like randomizing pitch and volume fading between sounds using game parameters like health and switching music cues in time with the tempo to more complex things like real-time mixing and profiling or using advanced spatialization features like rooms, portals, obstruction and occlusion. Learning audio middleware can be a daunting task, but they all function in similar ways and once you understand the basics, you'll be comfortable in no time. Of course, you can skip the middleware and simply use the features that the game engine provides. Unfortunately, these are often quite limited and require a lot more custom code to get the same functionality as audio middleware. However, the developers of some game engines like Epic Games, who made Unreal Engine, have put a lot of effort into upgrading their native tools to be more accessible and useful to sound designers. Additionally, some publishers have their own custom engine, like for example, Ubisoft Snowdrop, or EA's Frostbite engine, which provide their own tools for sound designers. On bigger projects, you often have dedicated audio programmers who create custom tools to make the sound designers' lives easier. It's important to show them some love as they are incredibly underappreciated and add so much value to the team. <sighs> Lots of info. But just remember, as long as you can explain clearly what you want the sound to do, you will almost always be able to solve the problem with the help of your collaborators and peers or alternatively, Google. After hearing all of this, it would seem that implementation is the last process in the chain. However, this couldn't be further from the truth. Audio implementation should never come as an afterthought. As a matter of fact, it is a key area to explore when starting a new project. There are three simple reasons for this. First, no matter how good the sound, if it's not in the game, then the player will never hear it. Second, the way the sound will play back usually shapes the design of the sound as well as the production pipeline around it. 
And third, collaborating with the design and programming teams to create audio systems for certain gameplay mechanics early on will ensure that the audio team can deliver their best work and won't simply be left behind. Additionally, creating custom tools for the sound designers will save a bunch of tedious work and time and allow for more polish. And now to the fun part of the video with some of my favorite examples of great audio implementation, starting with the heart and dishonor telling you dialogue lines and pumping when in close proximity to a bone charm or room. The commentator system in FIFA and other sports games. A chance then for the respective managers to address their charges. It is half time here. The Doom Glory kills that are in time with the music and make the experience so satisfying. And lastly, the Mario Odyssey electricity drifting. Of course, there are many, many more, but these are just some of the noteworthy ones that I wanted to share. Let me know about your favorite audio implementation examples in the comments below. I would love to hear them. There can be a huge amount of sounds playing at any given moment in order to bring large worlds like Los Santos from GTA or Hyrule from The Legend of Zelda to life. So it's important that we only play the sounds the player needs to hear at any given moment. This is for two reasons, the first one being clarity. Audio has to inform and guide the player, immerse them into the world, support the narrative, and provide feedback on their actions. This means that the sounds and music the player needs to hear change frequently. The process of balancing everything to make it cohesive is called mixing, but more on this topic in another video. However, the mix of a game not only occurs before the release, but also in real time while you are playing the game. This happens through systems that the sound designers and programmers create. They determine what the player should hear at any given moment. A great example of this is the dynamic mix in Overwatch. Cutting through the mix, you can hear her above anything else. Another example, listen for the footsteps. Oh, oh, no. on their way. Another example will be the music changing when going from exploration to combat in a game like Breath of the Wild. These changes in the mix wouldn't be possible without audio implementation being a big part of the initial planning phase. The second reason is optimization. This is the process of saving as much memory and CPU power through clever implementation and systems as possible. For this to make any sense, we need to first understand that in order for the sounds to play back, they have to be preloaded in the game's memory. One of the ways we can optimize this is by only loading the sounds we need. Take Monster Hunter World for example, each time we enter a new area, the sounds of the previous one are unloaded and the ones for the new ones are loaded. Sound files that are really long, like for example the soundtrack of the game, can be streamed. This means that the audio file doesn't have to be preloaded in the RAM and can instead be loaded from the hard drive. There might, however, be a short delay when the game engine triggers the event. This makes it ideal for long looped ambiences and music, but not very useful for things like gunshots and footsteps. Additionally, there is a maximum amount of sounds that can play at any given time. So another useful method is to cull the sounds that aren't needed. A basic way of doing this is assigning priorities to each sound. When the limit is reached, the system cuts the sounds with the lowest priority. Lastly, I want to show you a cool optimization example from the Outer Worlds. To bring life to this river, the usual method will be to put lots of emitters around it. The team at Obsidian, however, designed a system which automatically creates a spline, basically a virtual path along the river. They stick a single sound emitter on it, which follows the player around. This not only lowers the voice count, but also saves time, which would be spent on setting up the emitters manually. If you want to dive deeper into this topic, and I would definitely recommend to do so, then follow these three simple steps. 
Number one, research. I've linked a game audio learning resource list in the description, which you can filter by audio implementation to find tons of great resources. Just by watching video breakdowns and reading articles and interviews on how your favorite audio systems were created, you can learn a whole bunch. The amount of information that's out there can be quite overwhelming, so I recommend dedicating 20 to 40 minutes of your day to deliberate learning and build up a habit. The next step is to recreate some of these systems in a test project to apply and solidify the knowledge through practical application. The great thing is that popular game engines like Unity and Unreal Engine, as well as middleware like Fmod and Wise are completely free for solo or small indie developers, so you can dive in and practice. And lastly, experiment. Get creative and use the knowledge you've gained to come up with your own systems and show them to your peers to receive feedback and improve upon them. I can't emphasize enough how important it is to try out new things, fail, learn and try again. Most of my knowledge from computers comes from having a really dodgy one when I was growing up, which will constantly break. I spent hours on forums trying to figure out the source of the problem and um, very often rage quit. <laughs> Usually it would leave me nowhere near the actual solution, which was super frustrating, but I learned incredible amounts in the process. Thank you for making it this far. I hope you learned something. As always, a huge shout out to our Patreon supporters. If you'd like to join them, then check out the link in the description and see you next episode. Cheers.